Guys, I am pumped to finally show you guys how the Intel 11th generation parts perform. We have done a whole bunch of, wait, what was that? You th we've already talked about this? I've actually already made a video about it? I don't believe you, let's take, let's take a look. Uh, but it's just not gonna be that much more better. So there's only a couple instances where I would actually pick up the 11th gen processors. Oh snap, this is gonna be awkward. Hey guys, Turk here. I hope you're having a great day. First off, I want to apologize for not getting this video out as a day one review. Intel only just shipped me the parts and I received them on Friday. So rather than rush through the entire minutia of Intel's latest release, I want to do my due diligence and give you guys the straight and honest answers. Intel's latest release has caught a lot of shade from my previous performance predictions. Early reviews from Anantech and Gamers Nexus have unfortunately let the cat out of the bag, confirming my suspicions. As bad as these reviews have made it sound, there's actually a bit of good news from this generation of processors that should not be overlooked. Let's dive into the spec. We're going to be looking at five different processors today, including AMD's latest 5900X and our previously reviewed 8-core 10700K. Intel has provided me with the 11900K and 11600K, but you guys know me, I've got to hack something up. For the 11700K, I've gone into my motherboard overclocking menu and performed a bi-core overclock in order to match the various speeds supported by the 11700K. Since it's not an official part from Intel, I'm going to be noting it with an asterisk in all of the data today. Now let's kick things off with Intel's new flagship, the 11900K. Unfortunately, compared to the 10th generation chips, the 11900K has to drop two cores due to the back porting of the Cypress Cove's 10 nanometer design into the desktop's 14 nanometer package. To compensate, Intel introduces yet another boosting feature with thermal velocity boost in order to meet the aggressive performance targets. Thermal velocity boost aims to optimize core voltage settings during intermediate loads in order to obtain those impressive boost clocks. Coupled with the new Turbo Boost Max 3.0, Intel is eating into its voltage margins in order to eke out as much performance as possible. With that, the 11900K clocks in with a massive 5.3 GHz boost clock. The slower clocked 11700K loses access to that thermal velocity boost and unfortunately bends that processor down to an even 5.0 GHz, which is 100 MHz slower than the predecessor 10700K. Both parts do manage to maintain 16 megabytes of smart cache in order to feed the cores. The 11600K is the unlocked six core brother, which sees even more features cut with the downgrade to Turbo Boost 2.0 and a sub five gigahertz boost clock speed. Adding salt to the wound sees a reduction to 12 megabytes of smart cache. However, across the 11th generation, along with the newer core, a new memory controller is included, which enables DDR4-3200, and Intel finally enables PCI Gen 4 support across their processors. PCI Gen 4 does intrigue me personally, since all of the recent GPUs from AMD and NVIDIA support the interface, and many features are being built on top of the fast interface in order to enhance gaming performance. Intel Z GPU is also implemented with the UHD 750 with each processor's iGPU boosting up to 1.3 GHz and they all run at 32 execution units. Finally, each of these three processors is specced at 125 watts TDP, though Intel does spec a lower TDP down spec of 95 watts. Now, just looking at the numbers, I, it seems like the 11th generation has a lot of work ahead of itself in order to be competitive with both their older generation as well as AMD's 5900X. As doom and gloom as it sounds, there is a ray of hope with these new processors, and that's coming from their overall system platform. Intel did an excellent job with their Z490 boards, and with this launch, they are introducing their Z590 chipset in order to enhance and embrace the latest processors. With backwards compatibility in mind, 10th generation and 11th gen processors are compatible with either chipset. And as a bonus, if the board supports it, 11th gen processors with the Gen 4 PCIe are supported on older boards. This is a massive win for those that want to enable full bandwidth GPUs and NVMe drives without switching over to Team Red. 
Now I've got two fine specimens for review with ASRock Z590, PG Velocita, and ASUS ROG Maximus 13 Hero. So subscribe and hit the bell icon to see both of those boards reviewed in their entirety. For today's review, I'm going to be using the PG Velocita, and there's a couple of caveats to keep in mind. First, ASRock disables double tau performance boosting by default in their BIOS, and they do happen to follow Intel's guidance with the 56 second duration for their boosting on their motherboard. Also, it is implementing gear two with its memory frequencies, so if you guys see some results that aren't just matching up with some of your favorite channels, keep that in mind. Lastly, I like to test my products with minimal UFE intervention, so everything is going to be running stock out of the box except of enabling default XMP profiles. I'll post the rest of the system specs down below in the description, though most of it can be found in my 5600X review. I'll put a link to that at the top. Today we're going to be covering synthetics, applications, and of course gaming, but I'll also be covering overclocking, power, and thermals more in depth with each of the motherboard reviews. But I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a sneak peek towards the end of the video. With that, let's get to it. As with any processor review, Synthetic start us off today in order to confirm if the parts are working as intended. <coughs> and of course, I hit my first roadblock. My 11th generation parts faced problems running any of the PC Mark 10 tests due to some permissions issue when trying to select the proper OpenCL device with my testing. What's weird is the 10700K, it worked fine with my Intel test bench. <sighs> oh well. With Essentials, we start to see promising results from the newer processors. The 11900K paves the way in all tasks except for video conferencing, which favors the extra cores in the 5900X. Interesting here, the 10700K at the bottom seems to be bested by the newer parts, suggesting potential hope for the 11th gen. Let's keep going. <laughs> oh, yikes. This doesn't look good. The productivity suite shakes up the stack with the 11900K beginning to lose a little bit of ground but for running spreadsheets and Word documents, how bad could this get, right? Oh my God, I spoke too soon. Digital content creation, it leverages both the clock speed and the core count of the 5900X to take the win with these modern use cases, and we see each of the Intel parts falling in line. However, within the Intel camp, it does appear that the 11th generation 8-core parts are better than the last generation 8-core parts. Pivoting to gaming synthetics, we continue to see similar CPU scaling as with PCMark. Looking at the gray bar here, Firestrike Extreme scales very well, though we do see pretty good GPU limited results from the rest of the benchmark data. Switching to TimeSpy, CPU scaling in green shows similar behavior, though less dramatic in slope. This shows a gradual shift down the stack, with the overall score favoring the 5900X and trickling down the processor lineup. As I mentioned before, the latest Intel processors sport a new memory controller, so how does this look with performance? Opening up Sandra, it appears that the 11th generation parts benefit from a 10% point increase in the overall memory bandwidth, surpassing even AMD's multi-chip implementation. As for latency, we do see a 40% increase in response time, though Intel's designs are nearly three times quicker than AMD's offering. Let's see if this trend continues with some application benchmarks. Of course, having more cores gives AMD the easy win here, but what's interesting to see is with handbrake is how close the 11700K is to the 11900K. Also, comparing the old 8-core part confirms Intel's IPC claim with a 16 percentage point increase with H.264 and a 15 percent increase with H.265. Cinebench also confirms the claims with single-core results, and as expected, that performance lines up closely with my prediction video suggestions. Unfortunately, AMD's top chip is considerably ahead of the game. With DaVinci Resolve, I was hoping to see a considerable improvement with the inclusion of the latest Gen 4 PCIe with the 11th Gen processors, but unfortunately the increased bandwidth doesn't help AMD nor Intel when compared to the 10700K. When comparing the 700 level processors, Luxmark shows 11% improvement, POV Ray improves by 4%, V-Ray by 14%, and Geekbench by 10% confirming the IPC improvement ranges that we have been hearing about. Keep in mind that the 11700K is clocked 100 MHz lower than its older cousin, so it's a pretty strong showy from Intel here. 
And here's the silver bullet, in my opinion, for the 11th series processors, that's AVX512. Looking at single-threaded performance, scientific workloads can see an impressive 46% reduction in calculation times by implementing the latest instruction set. I will note that Y-Cruncher hasn't seen any optimizations yet for this latest generation processor, and implementing AVX512 might force multi-threaded scientific programs to throttle when compared to the older AVX2 instruction sets. Also, there's just not that many monsters out there that can actually be slain by AVX512, so this just might be some wishful thinking. So, it sounds like Intel's latest processors are a great success, right? Well, these parts are marketed as processors for gamers, so let's see if this strong performance carries over. Ashes of the Singularity is my go-to CPU benchmark, and sure enough, we see expected scaling across the parts with the normal batches from the test. However, with the medium and heavy batches, we start to see some bottlenecks appearing that finally hit the 11900 and 11700K. AMD continues to flex its muscles with a sizable advantage over Intel. Another angle to consider is the 10700K is not that far behind. GTA 5 tempers our expectations with each of the processors, capping performance right at around 180 FPS at 1080p, with only the 11600K lagging behind. Even at 1440p, each of these processors can utilize the RTX 3080 to the max. Pivoting to a GPU-bound game with Red Dead Redemption 2, only 3 FPS separate each of the processors today, and even at 1440p, we see consistent results across the board. <sighs> All right, here we go. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it's been a prime benchmark from AMD, and it's showing a lot of its strength, and unfortunately for the 11th gen parts, even the older 10700K beats them by 10 FPS. 1440p still delivers the CPU bottlenecking from the 11th series processors, and 4K levels the playing field across the board. F1 2020 continues the trend with AMD and older processors surpassing the best of the 11th gen. At least at 1440p, the 11900K finally comes out ahead of the 5900X. Ugh, now I'm just getting depressed. Call of Duty favors the 10700K at 1080p, shockingly low 1% lows with the 11900K. 1440p only has a 6 FPS gap between the 6 core part and the older generation. And at 4K, we're clearly pushing the limits of the GPU at this point. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Ugh. same story, different game. The older Intel part clearly paves the way at each of the resolutions, which continues to validate my predictions from my old video. Doom Eternal it continues the trend, where each of the above 8-core offerings is within frames of each other, and the 11600K does surprisingly well here at feeding the RTX 3080. 1440p shows the newer processors beginning to slip, but 4K keeps us slaying demons above 160 FPS. Now, I've found in my previous testing that Cyberpunk 2077 is a very CPU-limited game, and at 1080p, the 11th and 10th generation processors come out on top. There is a minimal bump in favor of the 11600 and 11900 at 1440p. This data was collected with the 1.12 patch, so I fully intend to circle back with our PS4 build in the near future. Metro Exodus brings us back to earlier games showing CPU scaling across the board, with AMD pulling ahead by a few frames. That lead does tend to disappear with the higher resolutions, and unfortunately for the 11th gen, the older part maintains performance at 1440p and 4K. Now that was a bit of a buzzkill now, wasn't it? On the one hand, it's a shame that to see Intel's parts not even surpass their older offerings, but on the other, all the processors today can nearly utilize the RTX 3080 to the extreme. Now let's talk briefly about temperatures and power consumption. I'll be covering this more in depth with my motherboard reviews, but it's essential to highlight the deltas from the old generation to the new. Looking at the gray bar here, it appears that with lighter workloads, the 11th generation hardware has improved its efficiency. However, engaging Prime 95 with no AVX512, the 11600K and 11900K increase their temperatures by nearly 8 degrees Celsius. Also, at least for the 11900K, the VRMs are getting pushed even further, in turn increasing the reported VRM temperature by 9 degrees Celsius. I'm adding in the AMD data here to highlight the thermal management differences between the two different platforms, mainly that AMD is very restrictive in boosting within a lower thermal limit. 
Now, let's consider total system power consumption. Interestingly, Ida64 manages to burn 30 watts more power while maintaining the same temperatures on the 11900K. And wow, full CPU load with Prime95 shows a 70 watt increase compared to the 6 core 11600K. But consider this, when gaming, power consumption is primarily dictated by the GPU load, so even if these numbers are massive, this represents the worst case load for the CPU. Again, AMD regulates its platforms within a specific power limit, and it's interesting to see both the light and the heavy workloads migrating to the same power limit. So let's wrap up the 11th generation launch. The optimistic side of me is really pleased with what Intel has delivered with their Rocket Lake processors in terms of IPC gains and application performance. Intel's single-threaded performance continues to dominate the market along with sizable improvements over their previous generations. When only considering the eight core chips, it's no contest that the 11900K and 11700K are superior to the 10700K. Heck, the 11600K throws punches above its weight class considering the two core disadvantage. But for gaming, the 11th generation falls short of any potential kind of hype. And this review validates findings we have known for over three months. Despite the IPC gains, the 11900K fails to differentiate itself from its own comparable product lineup. And with the reduction of cores compared to the 10900K, Intel has no chance to make it to the top spot on any of our charts across the games and resolutions. Finally, let's talk price. As of March 30th, the 11900K is a non-starter coming in at 614 USD at Newegg. For $65 less, you can pick up a 5900X, assuming you can find it in stock. Even the 10900K comes in $140 cheaper and probably performs better given our 10700K results. The 11700K comes in at a more reasonable 419, but still is getting beat in gaming tasks by a processor that's $40 cheaper. Let's not forget that AMD has many offerings in this same price range that are sure to be competitive in their own regard. The saving grace here though, in my opinion, is the 11600K. This $280 part manages to game at nearly the same level as chips that cost $140 more expensive and has enough horsepower to enable builders the capacity to get into digital content creation. With a little bit of compromises, of course. However, 8 cores is quickly becoming the de facto standard in computing, so there's no real telling on just how long this 6 core can keep up. Bottom line, the 11th generation parts are worth picking up if you have a specific need for PCI Gen 4, DDR4-3200, or future looking application performance right out of the box. Given AMD's recent popularity, the 11th gen likely will be in stock. However, the price tags attached to these new parts, they might just make it worth waiting for AMD. If Gen 4 PCIe or improved memory performance isn't critical for you, there are plenty of 10, 8, and 6 core offerings from various generations across the board that can fit your needs. They perform in the same ballpark as the 11th generation in gaming and likely at a fraction of the cost. And for budget builders, I recommend saving some bucks with the older parts and keeping your eyes peeled for those expensive GPUs. And that's going to be my 11th generation review, guys. I hope y'all enjoyed it. Again, I'm sorry this didn't come out yesterday. You know, we've been dealing with life here at the Turk Compound, and, you know, we've gotten these parts from Intel. So we've got plenty of other reviews coming down. We've got uh, the ASRock motherboard review as well as... You can't see it over here, but we're going to be reviewing the ASUS motherboard as well. So make sure, again, hit the bell icon and subscribe to the channel. We're going to be diving deep into these Intel parts and seeing if there's actually even more diamonds in the rough here. So thank you guys for stopping by. I hope you all have a great day. We'll catch you in the next one.